At the time, I was a lieutenant assigned to narcotics, so I was working out of the Bronx, and it was, uh, I was home. I was home with my son, who was two years old at the time, and my wife was working, and my two girls were at school. And uh, I took my son to visit my mom, and she answered the door, and I saw the look on her face, and I had no idea. I was just driving, you know, with my son in the car. So as soon as I learned of it, I, um, I saw the news quick on the TV at my mom's house, turned around, went home, called my wife, and headed to work. And uh, I remember thinking, driving to work, you know, the, the unknown. What, what, were we, what were we in for? Um, are we at war? Which I think the answer was yes, essentially, uh, the beginning of it anyway. And, uh, you know, I, I had a long drive to work at the time. Both, both buildings were down as I drove down to work and uh, I stopped at narcotics, uh, picked up a few people, uh, picked up a raid jacket and headed down to, to, uh, to what I thought was ground zero. It turns out there really was nothing to do. Um, and that was, that's my memory of 9-11. You know, that's the first thing I always, the senselessness of it because everyone rushed to help and really there wasn't much to do. Um, we, we stood around all day waiting for orders. We, we, we got close a few times and then had to run when some of the, the smaller buildings fell. Um, I didn't do much, I, you know, on, on September 11th. I was there with many of, you know, people, some that I still work with to this day. I always remember Tommy Galati, who is now, a, you know, the chief of intelligence. I spent the day with Tommy um, waiting blocks away from 9-11, but uh, we were all staged nearby. That really, um, you know, wasn't anything that we could do at that point. And, and in the coming week, you know, heading down there, working on the bucket brigade, um, seeing the firefighters, I never forget the look of the firefighters and how, how tired they were and wouldn't leave 9-11. Um, it was, uh, you know, yeah, I don't think of it often, but it's not far away at any time, if that makes sense. And you kind of compartmentalize it and push it away and, you know, the loss of life and everything that went through our head that week and the rumors and, you know, the, the entire first precinct was dead. And that was one of the stories that day. And thankfully that didn't turn out to be true. But you know, we lost 23 members that day in the police department and we're, we're near 300 um, as we stand here today. So, you know, that loss continues. And um, I just think of it as a, a Pearl Harbor type day. You know, it's, it's uh, 20 years. It's hard to believe that we have people coming on this job now um, that were young kids then, you know, it's just, it's just crazy. The 300 figure you mention are the number of people in the NYPD we have lost since September 11th to 9-11 yep. illnesses. I want people to be able to just digest that and the number continues to grow. Commissioner, take me back to what you were saying about working on the bucket brigade. What, what did that entail for you? I, uh, it was, it was the week of September 11th and, and, um, I think everyone did the best they can in terms of organizing and everyone wanted to help. Um, they were telling us actually there was too many people, right? People were coming from all over the country, the national guard, you know, you had firemen, retired police, I mean, you name it and just ordinary citizens. So, um, when, when we were first allowed to go down and, and get really close. It was probably two or three days after. Um, and, and it was a midnight and you had to volunteer and it was on your own time. And I came through the back of, um, this is one thing I'll never forget. I came through the back of Battery Park City, if you're familiar with the area. And you had to weed because you just couldn't get through any other way, really. And we came through and you walked through um, probably, you know, three to six inches of water because the firemen were pouring 
water on the fires and, and the fires stayed lit for months and months and months. So you came through the back of Battery Park and you're coming through on a midnight and it's dark, but they have lights set up and it's just a surreal scene. And when you come through and you see then the pile from that side, um, you would you would never imagine it. And and what you thought was it's going to take years and years and years. How are they ever going to clean this up? That's that's what I thought. And and uh, you know it was cleaned up much quicker. I, it's it's a miracle. You know it's it's really a credit to everyone involved. Um, that night, just working a line of volunteers with buckets and and trying to dig out by hand because the heavy machinery really wasn't in yet and looking for survivors and, um, you know, staying there and you, you stayed all night. And that's that's the memory I have um, sometime in the morning as it starts to get light out and just seeing some of those firemen who who were there searching for their friends and beyond exhausted and refusing to leave. And, uh, you know, just something I'll never forget. How much did you, how much time did you spend volunteering at Ground Zero? So, so from that, we transitioned to, um, as, as we started to get organized, you know, um, in terms of different, it's a large agency, so a lot of different assignments that affected me at least. I was in narcotics in the Bronx. We spent most of probably two or three months, that's what it seems like now, um, working in and around Ground Zero, but more different type of search and rescue. They had enough people on the pile, so we were doing um, just searching the buildings on the periphery. So, you know, these are buildings where the power is out, the elevators are out, the dark. People have been evacuated, but sometimes pieces of the planes hit these buildings. Um, so, and then escorts in terms of uh, allowing people to get, if you drew a large circle around that area, um, no one could get in, but people needed to get in and get their belongings if it's an, you know, emergency type thing. So a couple months doing that down there and then on, on you know, a rotation basis working uh, at the landfill in, in Staten Island. You were actually working there at the landfill? Oh, many times. Yep. That was supposedly one of the most dangerous places to work in terms of future 9-11 illnesses. Well, I, I could tell you that um, when some of the first individuals that worked the landfill were our undercover officers. So they didn't, uh, these are people that would go out and do buy and bust operations and things of that nature. and in terms of using every resource that we had, um, they were some of the first that were put there, figuring it was safe for them to go there, um, not blow their cover and their identity. And, and I'll tell you that they were there many weeks probably before I was. And when I got there, it was, you were handed a rake and you were sent out to a field that was maybe the size of a football field. And you're told to basically in a line sift and you're looking for human remains, really. Um, I could tell you that when you fast forward a year later, you would report to the same location to do the same job, but now they have decontamination tents set up and hot and cold washes, and it, it certainly changed a lot. So I would, I would agree with you that, um, you know, in terms of safety precautions, it, it changed quite a bit from when it started to when it ended. So how did you handle this? You're sifting for human remains. This is something that was just not even comprehensible before 9-11. We, we never thought anything like this could happen. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, it's nothing that anyone should have to do. Uh, um, it was beyond human, you know, you couldn't describe it to someone that wasn't there. That's what I would say. So you're, after about 10 minutes, everything looked the same. Everything had the same. And if, if anyone that was at the landfill knows what I was talking about, um, it was everything was the same color, the same consistency, but you're, 
it felt hopeless, but you're doing it because you're trying to bring closure to people. Um, so in the midst of that debris, maybe you find something. And, and maybe it's not just human remains, but maybe it's a, a wallet um, or, or an identification card that you know, made it through. And maybe that would mean something to a, a loved one. So that's the type of work that was going on. I will tell you though, that it was, um, again, you, you'd, you'd have to be there because everything literally had the same look, consistency. And after, after that terrible attack and all the jet fuel and everything that came with it, it, it wasn't as if you're really being able to discern what you're looking through at, at, at a point in time. We lost 23 NYPDers that day. Uh, how many of their remains have been able to be identified? You know what? Um, I don't know that definitively. Um, I, I know that we, you know, it, we quickly, I learned who was not there, but exactly how um, is, a, is a different case. Um, so I, I, I would have to get back on definitive with that. But, um, you know, there, there were there were some stories of people um, that were recovered. Maybe they were hit with something that fell down. But I, I think that the, the reality is that for many of the people that were in those buildings, there was nothing left of them. Um, True. 40 40 percent of those we lost that day entirely to close to 3000. Yeah, forty percent. Their remains have not been able to be identified to this day, and and occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, we learn that somebody else has been identified. This is close to twenty years later. Yeah, Commissioner, uh, I understand that you have suffered your own physical health problems as a result of nine eleven. Well, I I I, uh, I certainly have some uh, you know sinus and asthma issues that. I did not have before. I've had a number of surgeries, but I consider myself honestly to be pretty lucky. You know, when you first come down with some symptoms and you see what some other people are going through, um, you know, I, I consider myself pretty lucky. I also wanted to talk to you about the mental toll of 9-11. Those of you who were there that day, those of you who responded in the days after, including yourself, uh, you know, we're talking about post-traumatic stress. Do you feel that you have had that yourself? And if so, how does it manifest itself? I, I think that, um, thank you for asking that. I, I think that everyone handles it differently, you know, and uh, for me, uh, I've always been able to compartmentalize. So maybe I keep too much internal. Um, it's filed away. It really doesn't you probably think about it um, quite often, but it's not something that for me is uh, anything that I would consider an issue. I can tell you that when you go to uh, Mount Sinai for the monitoring or, or any of the other satellite places for healthcare, they pay quite a bit of attention and there's a number of questions and there's, there's um, resources available for people that uh, need it, which I think is a good thing. Um, and then you look at what happened just, just last week. I was at a funeral for a, a uh, individual that succumbed to 9-11 cancer. And, um, you know, it's not just the members and it's not just the workers that see their friends or colleagues become ill. It's, it's the families too. So it's, it's something that really 20 years later, um, whether you're talking firemen, police, um, people that lived in that area, where you, the construction workers, I mean, I, I remember many times thinking um, that that's some sacrifice by those construction workers too, operating that heavy machinery to clear that area out. And uh, you know, when, when we go to Mount Sinai, this is who you see to this day. Um, you sit, you wait for your examination. Hopefully, the news is good, and and you uh, you know you you keep track of yourself. But you're sitting around in that waiting area while you're waiting to be seen. Um, it's almost like a reunion in many ways. How did 9-11 change your life personally or and your thoughts and your beliefs, if at all? 
Wow. Uh, it certainly changed my life, um, you know. Um, It's a great question. I, I'm not quite sure how to answer it. Um, you know, on a, on a personal level, I could I could probably talk for hours. My brother, my younger brother, joined the military after 9/11 and remains serving to this day. Um, you know, who who I, I think that day um, really changed the course of not just you know anyone's individual status, the, the world, the world changed a little that day. Um, certainly there was terrorism before, um, but when you, when you think of, uh, you know, how you go on a trip or, or go to a sporting event or anything else, um, with the security precautions that you go through, um, how we police New York City has certainly changed. Uh, you know, many, many different ways it, it has changed. On a personal level, um, I, I Maybe I would argue that, you know, life goes on and, and that sounds callous, but you have to, um, for some it didn't, for some it, it they, they bear the scars quite evident, uh, evidently. Um, I'm of a, a mindset that uh, you kind of bury it a little bit and you keep it with you and you don't forget, but you keep pushing forward. And um, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's a part of history. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you thank for opening up. I know it was difficult, and, and I really appreciate it, and I'm honored to have you included in 9-11 stories. Uh, thank you.